quite nerve-wracking uh, introducing theatre and dramatic people when you're not very used to public speaking. Okay, so now we have out of the way. Welcome again to this panel discussion. John Patrick Byrne, Adventures in Theatre, as part of the exhibition John Patrick Byrne, A Big Adventure. Uh, I'm Martin McSheffrey Craig and I curated the exhibition here at Kelvin Grove. Uh, I primarily, primarily knew John through his visual arts and of course Tutti Frutti, because if you're Scottish you know Tutti Frutti. Um, to my shame I wasn't as aware of John's impact on the theatre world as his playwright or theatre making, but it's been a real joy to have enveloped myself with everything burn and, it's, and I'm much the richer for it. And I would say uh, from speaking to people who have came to the exhibition, that it seems as if that is a lot of way people come in from different angles, from the theatre or from the visual arts or um, TV, etc. Um, and what's been great to see is that when people have been coming to the exhibition, they've been really going out and exploring more about John. But then I guess I presume I'm probably speaking to the converted here in this, this room. So tonight we're focusing on John's theatre work uh, with four amazing guests who can really talk from their experience and with passion about John's work. Uh, I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with them, but I'll give them a quick introduction that unfortunately won't do them justice, but I'm sure you'll, you'll hear from them. So, Andy Arnold has been the Artistic Director of the Tron Theatre since 2008. Previously, he was the Artistic Director of the Arches, a venue and theatre company he established in 1991. He directed Burns' plays Calhoun and McBride and Burns' adaption of Tchaikovsky's Three Sisters. And I'm sure you all saw uh, Burns' most recent play, Underwood Lane, which Andy directed and had a sold out run at Johnson Town Hall and the Tron. David Heyman is an actor and director working to critical acclaim in TV and film and theatre. David directed the original Slab Boys production. Then I wanted, went on to direct the trilogy at the Traverse Theatre and the revival of the six. He's currently touring in his one-man play, Time's Plague, uh, which he just finished at the Fringe and is going on for a 30-date tour around the country, one of which is on a moor on the 18th of September here, so you can come and see the last day of the exhibition and go and see the play. It's a good double bill. Um, and we have Elizabeth Newen. Um, Elizabeth has been the Artistic Director at Pitt Oakley Theatre since 2018. Before that, she was eight years at Bolton Octagon, five as Associate Director and three as Artistic Director. Elizabeth's creativity and talent and ambition was clear for her first season at Pitt Oakley in 2019, in response to which The Guardian's Mark Fisher remarked that rarely has this theatre seen so much part of the public sphere. Elizabeth developed audio plays as part of the Soundstage programme, one of which was the production of John's children's book, Donald and Benoit, which she adapted with Janine Byrne. Uh, it premiered in December to, uh, 2021, and you can hear some of the wonderful audio play in the exhibition in the Donald and Benoit room. <coughs> okay. And finally, by, but by no means least, we have Joyce McMillan, who is a political writer and theatre critic for The Scotsman. Joyce also broadcasts regularly on the BBC Radio, um, BBC Scotland, sorry, and Radio 4. She's written a history of the first 25 years of the Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh, where obviously the Slab Boys trilogy debuted. So, firstly, can we have a wee round of applause for our guests? You'll be pleased to know that Joyce has very kindly agreed to lead this conversation uh, for us, but if uh, I may, I think I would maybe want to kick it off with a quote from Joyce, if that's all right. In the 1999 Scotsman article, How Scottish Theatre Won the Hundred Year War, Joyce wrote, <coughs> sorry, I'm sure you also read this out, the opening of John Burns' Slab Boys in 1978 was perhaps the key moment when Scottish theatre leapt decisively from the reproduction of various established traditions or representations of Scotland and claimed the freedom to map, celebrate and transform into high art the life of post-war Scotland as it actually was. It was the point when it finally became clear that Scottishness was not a dying or fading culture, but a thriving, chaotic, ever-changing, postmodern one with a future as well as a past. So, we have this quote in the exhibition, and it seems like the perfect place to start. So, Joyce, if you don't mind, I'd like you to start off and maybe talk about that quote and why you think John's work is so important. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm obviously, I'm keen to move on to um, um, discussing all this with the rest of our panel. But I think the reason I wrote, wrote that then, more than 20 years ago now, um, and the reason I would still write it is because of the huge impact, not only that, that John Burns' um, theatre work had on me, but the impact that I saw it having on other people of my generation um, around Scotland. Um, John uh, was part of a, a very lively, uh, when he finally started to do theatre in the 1970s, that is, he was already relatively well known as a painter, certainly in Scotland. Um, and when, when he started doing theatre, he became part of a very, very lively theatre scene in the Scotland of the 1970s. Some of you will know that uh, uh, half a decade earlier, in uh, the early 1970s, 784 Scotland had completely um, transformed the scene and the whole debate about theatre in Scotland with the TV at the Stag and the Black Black Oil, which was a, you know, a formally inventive uh, uh, Cayley style piece of theatre that raised all of these issues, which are still burning issues today about Scotland's resources, who owns them um, and who gets to um, profit um, from them. And from that moment in the, the 1970s became a tremendously exciting decade in Scottish theatre. Uh, David, as an actor, was at the Citizens Theatre then, and Giles Havergal, who was actually uh, close to John McGrath, and had um, John McGrath of 784, and had a very close relationship. Uh, but Giles Havergal and his fellow directors at the Citizens were absolutely exploding the idea of what might happen on the Scottish stage in terms of brilliant, um, innovative, classical productions with design that I still have never seen the equal of in all the years since. Um, since they stopped um, running um, the Citizens' fantastic spectacle going on on the stage at the Citizens, and lots of representations of Scottish working class life uh, beginning to come through. Um, and there were various people writing about Scottish working class life and its evolution. Tom McGrath had written The Hard Man that decade, which was a play before it ever became a film, A Sense of Freedom, um, and all the rest of it, and collaborated. Um, um, in, in writing, um, in writing the play, um, so that the, the, he had written that at the Lyceum in Edinburgh. Bill Bryden, the Scottish director, who went on to be a director of the National Theatre in London, and um, uh, Greenock-born Bill Bryden from a shipbuilding family. And um, Bill was was writing plays like um, The Bevelers and Willie Ruff, um, which were um, which were you know uh, generally quite naturalistic representations. Of Scottish working class life, and some of them, um, of a, you know, the the, the the very roughest edges of Scottish working class life too. So all of this was going on. There was quite a ferment of activity going on, and yet what John Byrne did when that when 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 the writers' cramp opened in 1977 at the Colton Studios during the Edinburgh Fringe, and then the very next year the Slab Boys came on the scene at the Traverse. What he did was so original and so, so unique, really, that, um, that, that it really made an exceptional mark, even in that very, very lively um, Scottish 1970s theatre scene. And I think the thing that John Byrne brought to the scene was um, the, this invention um, um, in some of the, the films that are about John in the exhibition, you'll see people talking about how he invents a whole world how he creates a whole world. And in taking the sort of rich detail of a moment in working class life in Paisley and turning it into this fantastically well-crafted, tremendously funny, fast-moving, stylish play, which really wasn't very naturalistic, really was quite you know, highly styled and crafted and kind of almost baroque in its, in its um, tremendous detail. And um, by doing that, he not only kind of recorded and respected Scottish working class life, he made it the centre of a whole creative world. And it was that feeling of this being the centre of the world, not any kind of periphery, not any kind of underclass, not any kind of, um, not any kind of um, sort of pity, uh, you know, object of pity. It was the idea of the, the creativity, the eloquence, the poetry um, of that vision of working class life that just changed things for people. I could feel barriers falling down in my mind, first as I watched Writer's Cramp, and then as I watched 
um, the Slab Boys, and I was thinking, my goodness, you know, it's all about the future, it's all about creativity, it's all about absorbing everything that has happened to Scottish working class people since 1945 and then moving forward. You know, there was never in denial about uh, the influence of American culture on Scottish working class culture, which was absolutely central for John. You know, it was all incorporated into this vision of what life was like at that moment in 1957 in Paisley, but then of course processed again and presented to audiences uh, more than two decades on. And so it was an amazing moment and also it was just such a tremendous fun. I mean, people just laughed themselves absolutely sick at that first production of The Slab Boys. It was so, so funny. Um, so I won't go on, but that was the initial impact that it had on me. It shifted my sense of what it was to be Scottish on its axis. And I think it did that for a lot of people. It just gave you a different perspective and a different sense of our possible creative futures. And that was just a fabulous moment. So that's why it's so exciting to have with us the man who directed that very first uh, production of The Slab Boys, and certainly in its... Um, in its, in its Traver, Travers incarnation, David Heyman. And I'm going to ask all of our panellists about their first encounters with John's work and what it, what it meant to them when they first um, encountered it. But I'm going to start with David because of that um, special moment. David, um, tell us about your first encounter with John, the uh, first encounters with John, and then um, what it was like really to have this script in your hands and to be directing it. Uh, my first <clears throat> encounters with John were kind of social. He would, I spent 10 years at Glasgow Six doing the classics thing, Hamlet, Lady Macbeth, Troilus, Nijinsky, you name it. And we did them all in RP. And John would come along and see them. And one day at the end of, nearly the end of my 10 years, there was John and his first wife, Alice, sitting in the canteen. And he said, David, come, come and sit down. He slipped along a, pack, a package. He said, that's for you. I said, what is it? He said, it's a play. I took it home and I read it. Can you all hear Sorry. me? Yeah, we're projecting doing it. I don't know if your mic's staying there. You're, at the moment, you're, you're doing so you're really maybe not the device. Hello, hello, hello. It's hello. not being recorded. Is that all right, Amy? Give me a I don't mind not being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> they do. They do for the There's no money involved. <laughs> while, while we're sorting that, just um, um, David quickly mentioned RP there, and just for those of you who don't always hear that phrase, it's um, it's received pronunciation, most of you will know, but it's received pronunciation, which is the, the habit, the habit of doing um, classics in Scotland, oh, well, um, yeah. in, in the voices of, of sort of, um, you know, Bayswater, basically. <laughs> and, um, and, or some other know, unfashionable know, bit of London. Can, <laughs> you, can you hear me, Amy? Oh. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Can we? Oh, yeah. 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 Sounds like a voice inside my head. <laughs> um, so John handed me this package and he said it's great. And I took it home and I read it and I had never, it just came alive off the page. It was written in the vernacular, my vernacular, the language and the tongue that I grew up with. And I've never seen this before on stage. I've never read anything like it before. I hadn't seen writer's cramp. I hadn't seen because I was on stage all the time. I hadn't seen uh, TV and Stag and the Black Mac Oil. So for me, this was a genuine revelation. And I just literally pissed myself laughing. <laughs> I mean, every second line is a cracker. <laughs> and, uh, and John, I mean, wonderfully, he said, I want you to direct it. Uh, and the rest is kind of history. John and I then spent uh, the whole of the rehearsal period with handkerchiefs <coughs> and wiping the tears off our faces because we just couldn't stop laughing. They're a wonderful, extraordinary, um, creative bunch of actors who really took to it and just grasped those, that wonderful language and kind of brought it alive. Um, and as Joyce said, it's, it's heightened. It's mm. not naturalistic. And every, I mean, certainly in my productions, you have to... 90, I think 90, and because you, you've got such action in a small, tiny space with slab, with slabs in the middle, and you've got up to eight characters, it all has to be tightly choreographed. So like 98% of that was literally choreographed. And you have to because the precision has to be there. <coughs> and I think that was something that was quite unique as well in Scottish theatre. But, but to sit there night after night after night and just watch audiences, I'd love to, I didn't watch the actors, I watched the audience. It was sheer joy, just a joy to see people coming and listening to something in their own language, their own tongue about 
about their own history. You know, I think you said it beautifully, Joyce. You know, to, uh, with that creative, that creative, like working class creativity. Mm. Uh, a sheer joy. A sheer joy. Yeah, and and um, was it difficult for actors to do? I mean, did they find it challenging because because it wasn't. Um, you know, it wasn't naturalistic, it wasn't like a, a big up version of a television play, it was something else entirely, it was more like sort of dance with, and the, the lines, you know, I mean, actors have to be very precise to get the laughs from those lines, you know. Yeah, but I'm good at casting Joyce. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't cast anyone who wasn't up to it. Yeah. <clears throat> now we went through a very... <clears throat> I mean, I don't audition actors now because I don't believe in it anymore, but I did in those days, and we made a very long, lengthy period of auditions just to find, tune things out. Some people turned us down. Plucky Jack Hogg, I offered to, um, oh, what's his name? God, I've forgotten his name. Tony, Tony Roper, whom you all know. Oh, yes, later to <coughs> And Steamy. Tony, Tony yeah. then said, no, David said, I have to turn you down because, now he came in and read it beautifully. I mean, both John and I said, well, Tony, it's your part. And uh, he said, I have to turn it down because I'll spend most of the evening in the dressing room being deeply jealous of everyone else on stage, getting all the laughs. <laughs> he then came along to see it and saw Robbie Coltrane playing the same part and he changed his mind. <laughs> he said, I wish I had said wish yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, fantastic. Pookie Jack Hall, just for those who don't remember the place so well, is, is the kind of uh, sort of slightly more middle class character that doesn't get many, <laughs> he's many a, laughs. He's a blazer boy. Gets, yeah, he wears a blazer and, and gets to be a designer. With shiny buttons. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. well done. Those are going out there. Don't get any shiny buttons on, all good. He escapes the slab room. Anyway, it was a fantastic production and it went on to have quite a long life, didn't it, David? I mean, it, it travelled well, London. Was, and well, I was involved in it for about four years doing the whole yeah. trilogy. Yeah. Um, we did Slab Boys and then two years later we did Cutting a Rug, which was a completely different experience altogether because when John, uh, John did 27 drafts of the Slab Boys before he put it into my hands. Mm. Not one word was changed. It was perfect. When he delivered Cut in a Rug on the night before we were due to start the rehearsals at the Traverse on the Sunday evening, it was a mess. <laughs> it was... The, 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 you know, you've got the elderly characters and you've got the younger characters, and there were two separate chunks, and what I did was I sent, <coughs> I sent the actors all home for two or three days and said, I said, go away. <coughs> and I went, took to my girlfriend on my wife's flat, and I just took the whole script and just cut it into speeches. Every single speech was separate, and then I just created another kind of jigsaw and interlapped, in, inter, mm. they made both uh, the male and female toilets in the first half and then brought them both mm. in the second. That was a more difficult piece of work to make work because it's not as perfect a play. And John, and John knew that and, and I knew it mm. as well. Mm. But it was still hugely successful. And then yeah. two years after that we did the final piece and then we did all three for the very first May Fest. Mm -hmm. at the Citizens Theatre so you could come one day on a Saturday and see all three plays. That was just, ex that was a very, very extraordinary experience because by the end of it, all you literally had to do was lift, lift an eyebrow and you'd have the audience see you. I mean, <laughs> you lived with those characters for hours throughout that day. Yeah. It was a celebration of life. It was indeed. And it's universal. Ending in a graveyard, which is a classic burn thing, of course, that if you'd have a celebration of life <laughs> and finish it in Oxhead Cemetery. Um, Oxhead Cemetery, Paisley. Um, 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 and, and of course, there was a moment when, because Billy McCall couldn't do it, you had to take over the role of... Um, well, this was two weeks before we were due to open all three, the all, all three plays at the, at the first Mayfest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and Billy McCall dropped out for reasons unbeknownst to me, and I still quite, can't quite understand because he was such a magnificent actor. Um, <coughs> he went off to do a play above a pub in London and kind of disappeared without trace, and Billy never really rebuilt his career after that, and I think it's a great sadness. But, um, so I had two weeks to go to recast the lead in each of those three plays, and I thought that's a massive, massive task for any actor to do who comes in with fresh, so I thought, right, I've lived with these plays for three years, why don't I do it? I was too old for it, but I stuck a wig in my head. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I managed to get away with it. I just, but that was extraordinary for me because I, I directed all three plays, the premieres of them, and now I was starring in all three plays. Um, I don't know, oh, it's really strange that I tell you this. At the end of those four years, I remember coming off stage at the sets 
This was the last performance ever. I directed all three plays, I starred in all three plays. I came off and John and Alice were in the dressing room as I took off my dust coat and I put it down. I said, John, I've given you four years of my life. I said, I'll hand this on to another generation to create a new, come up with a new generation of slab boys. He didn't really talk to me for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Um, it wasn't until the reunion of the Traverse that you, you were at, Joyce. That was the first time I'd seen or spoken to John in 30 years. Um, well, you know, passion. It burns oh, up. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's certainly a very passionate I love, I love the man to, to bits. I think yeah. he's, a, he's yeah. a genius. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Janine, please give her mom a love. Janine, I know you're out there. Janine, yeah, she's there. <laughs> You've changed your hair. <laughs> please give him my fondest love. He's a very special man. Um, yeah. Okay, and one last question about that before I move on to the other panellists. Um, John, um, at that time, almost always designed his place himself, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He designed the, the original He designed the original set. Yeah. 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 Which was, I mean, a work of art in itself. Yeah. Just to see John, I mean, the, 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 uh, the hours he put in. I mean, if you go to the, if, you, if I went to the theatre at two o'clock in the morning, if I said, he'd be there painting little details. <laughs> little tiny details, the audience would never see him because they're too far away from it. But for him, that was his level of perfection. Yeah. To reach that level that, that uh, he, yeah. was, he was pleased with and proud of. Right, yeah. So, but I remember, sorry, just about details. When, Ger when Gerard Kelly played Spanky, and, and, and he's a, he was a stickler for um, punctuation, I remember saying that Kelly was terrified of him, he was terrified of John. <laughs> remember John twirling his moustache. Kelly, where's the comma? <laughs> Kelly shot <laughs> And he, the comma was there every single performance. <laughs> Absolutely amazing, the, the, the late and much missed Gerard Kelly, who became the definitive Spanky in a way, despite fantastic work that Jim Myers did in the very first um, production. Yeah, and I think you can see um, those of you who are younger that this was what 40, uh, 44 years ago, the very first um, production of the Slab Boys. I first saw it. 40 years ago in 1982 and yet look how vivid it still is <coughs> episode in, in our memories you know I mean it shows you what a kind of uh, tremendously vivid moment it was so Andy at that time you were around in Scotland I think more or less weren't you you were at the yeah. theatre workshop in yeah. Edinburgh mm -hmm. and um, despite being a London lad by origin yeah and Essex oh Essex sorry the only way absolutely <laughs> <laughs> And um, and um, you were you were around. So when did you first sort of get this inkling of this tidal wave of the burn creativity? When did you first come? Across Probably it was it was the same production that you were at in the early eighties, yeah. I think, the Slab Boys. And I before I got that job at their workshop in early nineteen eighty, I had amongst other things been a freelance cartoonist. I was obsessed by cartoon drawing, and I had I got on my wall three copies of the the three. Posted the Slap Boys oh, yeah. Yeah. and they, they were extraordinary. I mean, I, I, I was aware of John's work and so I was too different on the telly but was that then? Or was that a little bit later? A little bit later. Yeah, okay. But I mean, that his graphic drawing really hypnotised me because I didn't seem like it before. Uh, those, you know, almost in the same way I was at the time obsessed by the likes of Gerald Scarf and so on and stuff, and that grotesque um, but incredibly um, recognisable characters he's able to draw. Fascinating. And so it was actually, the, it was the posters rather than the play in some ways that I was hypnotised by, but then the play itself as well. But I think that was really my first um, uh, awareness and that I was aware of him as a, as a person and, and you know, the, visually how extraordinary he always was uh, to it. And, but we didn't actually, we now our paths may be across, but we didn't really get to know each other until um, it was, we were both in about, uh, this is in the 2000s, we were both given an honorary doctorate award at Strathclyde University in the same night and uh, Janine and John were there and I was there with Mira and my wife and um, uh, we were at this very posh Strathclyde University place near Loch Lomond um, in our dinner jackets and 
uh, John going off to roll a fag when he could. And, uh, I, I <laughs> but looking tremendous. Looking there, tremendous. I, I, I didn't have a dinner jacket, so I went out of the the the, 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 uh, the Atron, um, wardrobe, and then, and then just as we were going to meet everybody, you know, there was a big hole in the crotch of cereal, <laughs> uh, which ruined out quickly. So, uh, and um, uh, so, and we were sitting together, listening to this, the rector of the university make us all stand up to toast the Queen. It was really bizarre the whole thing. So I think we, we bonded at that moment actually, and um, yeah, and it was yeah, uh, and we kept in we kept in touch. And then I don't know how it came about. I had this idea of doing uh, Chekhov's Three Sisters. I had the idea of doing the Three Red-Headed Sisters because Mirren had red hair as an actress, and she was Sally Reed was very similar to Mirren. They used to get computer mixed up with each other and they were so the idea of doing three red-headed sisters and um, I don't know whether I heard that John was thinking interested in writing or whatever we commission anyway I, I phoned him up and we met uh, at Glasgow um, Film Theatre Cafe to talk about it uh, and he was very keen to do it and he, we commissioned him to write it he might have already been working on it because he was very John was always very interested in Chekhov work he's given me a copy of The Seagull actually which I've got um, and I think that's his, that work is very, you know, a lot of his work is very Chekhovian, if there's any comparison with other writers. Uh, and so, and we did this production of The Three Sisters, which John also designed with a young designer, Charlotte Lane, who had worked yeah. with on Ulysses. Uh, and, but he was always there um, uh, with his fag in his mouth and his bare feet. Even at the technical rehearsal, we never took a tech. So there's John on stage painting part of the set. Um, we still got, there was a, it was a, um, that set had a, it had a back wall of this house and there's a living room in this house and very cleverly in the last act the, the furniture moved away and the back wall suddenly became the outside wall to the garden. Uh, and so almost to, at the tech itself suddenly John decided to paint a huge great floral uh, motif on the floor underneath the carpet for the trip for the, and he also painted leaves onto the piano which I'm glad is still there on that piano uh, and uh, just adding these things. We did that and we did a uh, production upstairs of uh, Kahuna My Bride. Actually it's worth, I've done three productions of John's. I've done Three Sisters, Kahuna My Bride, Under Alan Lane and they're all completely different from each other yeah. in every way and it's, uh, that is a measure of the, uh, the man as a, as a writer and um, Kahuna My Bride is about these two Artists who were a big influence on John actually as a painter himself, the two Roberts they were called from Kilmarnock. Yeah, they're real, real people. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant artists who, from Kilmarnock, they suddenly became very fashionable in London, um, but they were t so outrageous the London Arts Society couldn't deal with them, uh, and they and they went downhill rapidly, and uh, one of them died of drink, the other one threw himself under a bus in, uh, in Dublin. So, uh, but that's the. You know, that's the art, mark of artists, um, the, the tragedy of life that goes with it to be. But um, uh, they, they, we, needed, we needed paintings of Colin and Bride, and, and John was constantly handing us paintings, which were he did himself, which were completely replicas of, of, of Colin and Bride's work. And there was um, this one moment in the play when they are down, you know, they're on their uppers at the end, and suddenly there's this huge great reveal of a Jackson Pollock painting. And uh, one of them says to the other one, well, if that's the future, we're fucked, basically. That might have been his deck line from you. And uh, we thought, how are we going to do that? And um, John said, well, I'll sort it out for you. And he came one weekend you know, up in the studio that we were doing it and just painted this massive great canvas, a complete, with a Jackson Pollock canvas. We still got it in the store at Trump. Uh, and uh, extraordinary, actually, just spent all day doing it. And um, uh, that, yeah, that involvement uh, in yeah in the piece, um, but I've, I've always, it, it, that sort of, I think that the, the, I think people like John are, you know, they're a complete one-off and they, I don't think we produce people like that anymore in artistic work. There's, uh, I worked for a couple of years before I came back to Glasgow, before the Arches, with a, an artist called Vivian Stashel who ran the thing called the Bonzo Dog Doodle Band and we worked on a piece of theatre together, Stingful it was called. And his, uh, he was a painter, he went, like John, he went to art school uh, and actually painted in a very similar way, very vivid, uh, slightly absurdist, brilliantly, technically wonderful portrait work and so on. Uh, but he also wrote and he also played music and he, 
there, there was no boundary, and, and they're similar age actually to John, and that similar thing of uh, of being a complete artist in every art form, and, and I don't know nowadays maybe we do mark what we do as directors or writers or artists, whatever, but that sort of artist um, is very special, and John has that extraordinary um, uh, ability to to cover all art and just be completely obsessed with the art. Mm -hmm. Not worrying about, Not as we are these days, worrying yeah. about ticking boxes with regard to what work we make or whatever, just focusing completely on, on the art form, knowing that it works. And when we produced Underwood Lane, I mean, the, there were some young actors in there who'd never come across a John Bond work, and they were, um, you know, not sure about the play. It, it, uh, but uh, I just knew there's something about it, because it dropped a church and you could criticise it. You could criticise the development of certain narrative arc of certain actors, whatever, and certain characters rather, in the piece. But there's just, but it, of course, it, you know, it ended up standing at Basin every night, and um, it just worked as a piece. But in a way, John knew in a way that how to make a piece of their work, and which sometimes the actors didn't recognise until they were doing it. They all eventually recognised it, but they didn't see that at first, because it is a, as you said yourself, it's a particular, the unique style of writing that he has that yeah. um, is not repeated by anybody else. Yeah, that was a wonderful young company you had though, and it was interesting because you, you were talking about how all the plays you've done were different. Well, Underwood Lane is a musical, yeah. and I suppose ideally it would have been a Jerry Rafferty musical, but they were, uh, because it was you know kind of based on the story of John's early relationship with, with Jerry Rafferty and Paisley and Underwood Lane, and, um, and, and, but, but the rights were not available for that, so it is a soundtrack of pop music from that period, from the early 1960s basically. Yeah. Um, um, and so there you were casting actors who could not only um, not only do the play, but also play many instruments and sing. And yeah. I mean, some of them were just the most fantastic, well, nearly all of them were fantastic singers. Yeah. It, was, it was originally, um, yeah. when John gave me the script originally, it was um, Underwood Lane, words by John Byrne, songs by John, Jerry Rafferty, which yeah. is you know, like, which was so good. good. But, and then we finally got we will go ahead with it because there's a lot of dithering back and forth and so on. Uh, and I said, I rang up John, I said, we haven't got the rights to these Jerry Rafferty socks. And uh, John said, oh yes, he's um, on his deathbed. He said, Joe, you know, you must do that crazy musical. And, uh, and he said, I've known his wife for 40 odd years. And, uh, but then he, uh, but I, I, then, then there were complications. And then John realised actually, wait a minute, this is daft. This is set in the late 50s, early 60s. You know, that was before Jerry Rafferty was writing those songs, making those songs. So well, let's do numbers from the era, and I'm so glad we did because they were they were brilliant. And it's I have to, yeah, hit it about when you mentioned they were incredibly talented bunch, but the person who brought all that together was Hilary Brooks. Hilary yeah. Brooks, it, it, she she got them every part worked to an actual T, and it, 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 it was brilliant. But um, yeah, it's a um, it's, it's it's a rare thing. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, but I mean, it, it just—it was just even at, at this stage, you know, when John is now 82, it was a kind of revelation that his writing wrapped so well around something that was was really a musical, you know, certainly yeah. a play with songs and really a musical. Yeah. Um, so just that actually, was, just on the moment, yeah. before I forget, yeah. the other the other connection with Vivian Stanshall, his obsession with Teddy Boy things, and <laughs> Vivian actually brought out an album which she painted and self-designed. It was called Teddy Boys Don't Knit. And so, <laughs> <laughs> Shetland boys do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay, um, right, so let's come on to Elizabeth, who is um, a younger generation of, of theatre director, I don't think either of the other two will mind me saying that. Um, Elizabeth, um, as you've heard already, arrived at Pitlockery Festival Theatre in 2018 after a very successful eight years at Bolton Octagon in a community that, uh, that sometimes doesn't have its uh, problems to seek, but it was a huge success there. So, Elizabeth, what was your first encounter with John, and what made you, you know, really have this drive to work with him? Because you have worked with him um, twice, uh, unfortunately because of lockdown, not on full productions, but the audio series which Pitt Lockery did as part of its response um, to lockdown included both Daniel and Benoit, um, which has been mentioned in the pictures in the exhibition, and also Tennis Elbow, which was, um, as John put it, the distaff or female version of writer's cramp, um, and, and absolutely brilliantly um, performed uh, for audio by a team of Scottish female actors, just wonderful um, and very, very funny. So you worked with him on both of those. So what, what was your first encounter with him and what gave you that impetus to work with him? So I knew John's work as a playwright and as an artist before meeting him. And then... Um, how, how did you? Ah, well, 
I got to know Janine first, and I'm now squeaking, Amy. Should I speak quieter? Okay. Um, I'll just enunciate and not project. Um, yeah, so I got to know Janine first, and then John started coming to the theatre. And I'm really not very good on any kind of opening night. You'll normally find me in a corner rocking <laughs> on my own, um, hiding normally. It's become like a running joke in the theatre. There's an open up, where's Liz? Oh, she's hiding. And John came to find me after a sh performance and sat with me and was able to speak to me about what he'd seen, and um, which is a production that we'd done of, of The Crucible. And he spoke so clearly to me about what he'd loved about the play and why and the production and all of these different things. And he said, I'd love for us to do something together. And I said, oh, that would be great. You know, trying to get myself out of my sheer state of rocking backwards and forwards from it being an opening night. So before any of the things that, you know, Donald and Ben was featured in the exhibition, this beautiful exhibition, isn't it amazing? It's just yeah. extraordinary. Yeah, it was extraordinary. It's amazing. And um, so we, so before doing Donald and Benoit, and before that was Tennis Elbow, um, we actually did um, a development on uh, Frida Kahlo visits the Tay Bridge Bar together <laughs> in the Pitlochry Festival Theatre rehearsal rooms. Me and John and Janine and David <laughs> Gregg, um, uh, one of Scotland's most prolific playwrights, forward slash runs the Lyceum, and several other artists. And John, to give you an image, is holding a tambourine made out of two paper plates and uh, uh, what are those um, like? You know what are they called the things that bend that you can pipe 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 bend, yeah, pipe with a pipe cleaner and a, you know a paper plate um, uh, you know bangy thing tambourine and we're all conjuring Frida Kahlo in the imaginary Tambridge bar um, and we'd spent a day drawing all together um, because obviously I think John is one of the ultimate polymaths as everyone's alluded to today you know he's the ultimate example of not being a jack of all trades, but being a master of all, you know. Mm. And um, so we were, our first artistic encounter was together um, with Janine as well, drawing and bringing to life Frida Kahlo and Diego. And as part of that development, John arrived with a book for me, which I still have in my living room and look through quite often, of Diego's murals. And um, that's how I really got to know John. And that's how our relationship grew, actually, um, by our shared love of just making work. And, and John is so brutally honest, which suits me great, because I'm, I've never been that sophisticated in, well, in any ways, really. And he's very good at being very honest and very clear, and he's really happy to educate and I've always been able to say to John, I don't understand it, I don't get it, why is that? Who is that person? How does that work? And, and he has been so giving to me um, to teach me things. And, um, and then from that, we then made Tennis Elbow, and from that, we all made Donald and Benoit together. And um, you often think John isn't listening. This is the thing that we've learned. So he'll be sat there, Drawing. Yeah, the sleeve one. You know, he'll be sitting there drawing, having a biscuit, and you say, "He's he's gone off the boil." You know, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he'll go, "No, that's not it," and you'll go, "Oh, great, John, what is it?" And then he will be so deft in his uh, clarity and assistance to you as a director or as a dramaturg, but also to the actor. And and I and I feel like when actors encounter John, and there are actors here this evening who made Donald and Benoit, when actors encounter John, they, they, they know they are in the presence of not just, not just a writer, I don't mean to diminish the writer at all, because in my world, writer is God, but, you know, the writer, but somebody who lives their work. He's an absolute source of true art, and it is a privilege to 
be with him and understand his work. And that's why it's really exciting to be thinking about making Donald and Benoit into a physical production yeah. where you can all come and uh, meet the best cat in the world. <laughs> um, and all the dogs, obviously. Um, but yes, and yeah, what, what other artists have the breadth of work that is so extraordinary on all fronts? Yeah, so it's been a great privilege to know him and I've learned a lot from him and he's also just been a really kind friend to me Amazing. which I'm very grateful for so yes yes um, absolutely um, fantastic Elizabeth you've worked you know across a few theatres down south up here um, and worked with a, a very wide range of artists because of the range of work that you did both um, at Bolton and here you know Pitt Lockery and um, for those of you who are regular attenders is a huge operation to run. It, it, um, it does you know, a, a very large number of plays each summer season and plays them in rotation. It involves casting a, 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 an ensemble company which can do all of those plays, which is a different kind of casting skill from what David was talking about, just casting for a single play and so on. So it's, it's, you know, it's a very big complicated operation that does a lot of very different kinds of work from classic cold drama to big musicals and things like that. So in all of your experience um, working in theatre, have you ever met a genius? I, I mean, I think of John as a genius, so I'll just use the word. Have you ever met someone with that sort of genius, that absolute focus on the work and the art that, that John has? No. No, I haven't. And I also have never encountered anybody that commits to their art so wholly and can't do anything other than that. Yeah, you know, other when, than what he's doing. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time with John um, in his in his personal environment and, and his work is within that and there's no, I was actually saying to Duncan earlier on, who's amazing, um, I was saying to Duncan, you know, we were talking about how there's sort of this belief that maybe you can be an artist or work in theatre and do a nine to five and I was like, if ever there was a requirement um, for people it's to meet John and know he's never done nine to five, that's not what this is, it's an obsession. Yeah. And I think that's fine, yeah. because if you walk into that exhibition there, that is a fine way to spend your life, that obsession, and we are all together today in this shared experience to share in that obsession, so no, I haven't, Joyce. Yeah, well that's interesting, because I've never met anyone like it either, and I've um, interviewed a heck of a lot <laughs> of people, sorry we're kind of referencing people who are in the audience now, but I, I do want you all to know that, that John's wife Janine is here, Janine Davies, now Janine Byrne, who is herself a tremendous theatre and lighting person. She's a uh, well known as a, a brilliant sort of lighting person. <laughs> Uh, but she's also now worked on um, on some scripts and, and other other aspects of theatre um, in connection with John's work. Daniel and Benoit, which we talked about, just for those who haven't seen the exhibition yet or, or come across the, the the book or the play, uh, is is um, is um, is a story about an almost orphaned um, wee boy called Benoit. Uh, his, his mother is is dead, and his father has gone off on a, a big voyage and not come back, and he's no idea if his father will ever come back. But he does have this talking cat called Daniel and they go on a great voyage through life together um, so that's a kind of story for children but actually it speaks just as much to to adults I think and who else have we talked about we talked about Duncan Duncan's the person who um, is the press officer of, of Pit Lockery Festival Theatre and I think has been on child care duties earlier this this evening with, with Annabelle's daughter so just so you know who we're talking about uh, when these names come up right now, um, we've had a good uh, long chat from the panel. We will come back to them later to get some, um, some final words from them about the sort of impact and, and sort of uh, 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 recognition of John's work, which um, it will be interesting. But I do want to involve the audience as well in this discussion, because I'm sure a lot of you um, have um, had great experiences of John's work, both as a visual artist and in theatre. Um, and some of you have even worked on it, I know see a few faces of people who've been involved in productions and things that I know of. So please, um, if anyone has any comment they want to make, anything they would like to hear the panel talk a bit more about, uh, or any question at all, um, now is the time. Um, please feel free um, to ask. And I think Martin has um, a microphone so that it can go on the record of the <laughs> meeting, as long as you're happy with that. Anybody like to start? 
anybody feeling a burning curiosity to hear the panel say more about something? Get yeah, gentlemen there. I knew it would be a man, it always is. <laughs> See Scottish women, they routinely wait, it must be a rule, to have to have heard eight men asking a question. <laughs> Apologies first for being a man. Oh, I <laughs> the thing in the exhibition, I don't, I don't know why I'm attracted to it particularly, is the picture of the cast of the Slab Boys in New York. And I'm just amazed at how they got that cast together. Young guys who were uh, starting out, I guess, why were they attracted to that particular production? How on earth did the Slab Boys get to New York in the, in the first place? It's, it's, it's an obvious jump uh, once it's done, but try and get it done would be, I think, very difficult. So anybody can comment on that, possibly? Um, I was <coughs> lucky enough, I, I did a film with um, Kevin Bacon, one of the original New York cast. We did a movie called uh, Where the Truth Lies. And, uh, and the first thing Kevin said, he's a wonderful human being, by the way. Uh, he's, the first thing he said to me was, David! Hey man, <laughs> you know the Johnny Byrne? <laughs> yeah, nobody ever got some Johnny. <laughs> no, Kevin, you, you can't. But it was the quality of the script, the quality of that story, the, the, the extraordinary nature of those characters. Because I said to him, I said, why did you do it? Was, it was him, it was Sean Penn, it was um, Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer. I had an extraordinary lineup of young American stars in a tiny little theatre in New York. Um, but he said, yeah, it was, it was the script, the quality of the writing, and the universality of, of the story. Yeah. Um, um, uh, uh, were you hands-on directing? Uh, I mean, who directed it when it got to New York? I, I've no idea who directed it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to clue, it wasn't me. I was off doing something else. No. And, and I mean, did anyone phone you up and say, what's the cultural, you know, no. did they need any no. guidance? No, nothing at all. Well, John was there. They didn't John was there. Yeah, they all the <laughs> I, I, yeah. <clears throat> they had the genius in person. Yeah. And of course, anyone who's been around the exhibition could see how close John always felt to American culture. Um, you know, that, that kind of feeling that I think a lot of Scottish working class people had, particularly in that generation, that American culture offered them a sort of escape route from the sort of hierarchies and snobberies that accompanied uh, culture in the UK, which is exactly what John, of course, set up in Writer's Cramp, when he has this vision of this lad from Backsteden Street in Paisley um, trying to ascend through the Scottish and um, the British literary establishments and just sends that whole concept up um, rotten. And, and uh, uh, the, the central character, Francis Seneca McDade, is this kind of imaginary public schoolboy, but from a Paisley working class background, um, which is a, quite a complicated concept, but it's so funny when you see it in action and Bill Patterson is playing Francis Seneca McDade, which I had the privilege to do. Um, 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 so yeah, um, I, I guess for that generation, American culture was a kind of it, it was like an escape route from that. It was a it was a, 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 a big, powerful, and in some ways prestigious culture, which didn't have those um, didn't have those elements of sort of class and accent and snobbery um, that, that people um, sometimes felt excluded by. Um, and I think it was extremely important to um, John. And I've spoken to other people of that generation, like Dave Anderson of of uh, Wildcat. He he always felt that it was really kind of shocked when he got to America and realised that he was a white guy, you know, because he identified so strongly with so many um, um, black American artists um, when he was young. I remember him telling me that. Um, so yeah, it, it was obviously a close, close relationship which somehow at that moment translated to New York in ways that, I, you know, astonishing, really. Um, and of course they also had successful runs in London these plays. I mean, I, I don't even quite know how, but they, they found a good audience in London, didn't they? Yeah, I remember they, 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 there was a, a really severe critic at the time, can't remember his name, thank God. What's your name, Joyce? But he said, we, we did, when we transferred the, the, the original Slab Eyes, it was upstairs at the Royal Court, tiny, tiny, tiny little theatre. And this uh, critic said, if you have to, climb upstairs to the Royal Court on your hands and knees to see one of the most exciting uh, plays and productions on the London stage, he said, you won't understand a bloody word. <laughs> <laughs> but people do. I mean, they, they, they think they're 
have no understanding, but of course they do. Uh, well, as soon as they tune the ears in, they understand fine. Right, more questions from lovely audience. Go on. Anybody here who's been in a piece of John Byrne play? I can see some people who are pretending not to be here, so they don't have to ask a question or describe their experiences of that. Hi, Joyce. Hello, Colin. Colin Andy. Andy. Actor. David. Uh, David, I've got a question for you and Andy might know, and probably Joyce as well. When Rain Dog did the production at the Arches of Still Life, and then they did all the flashbacks to uh, Slab Boys and Cutting a Rug. Correction. Yes. There were no flashbacks. That was one of the most exciting yeah. versions of the trilogy I've ever seen, or directed and conceived by Caroline Patterson. Yeah. She melded all three plays together, set them in a graveyard, and it was just an astounding piece of theatre. And we did it for, I didn't think we did it at the King's Theatre for Mayfest. I can't remember. Very, very clever, clever. Yeah, production. and what I was going to say was, having not seen the three originals before then, because I was probably too young, <laughs> I have <laughs> 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 David, are you surprised it's never been revived in that format, because it worked so brilliantly? Yes, and John himself loved it. Mm. He mm. loved that adaptation of his other three plays, yes. I'm surprised it hasn't been done. Yeah, I've forgotten about that call now. Yeah, it's it's yeah, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Very, very clever, Andy. Really clever. Yeah. And that was, Carol, that was Caroline's work. Caroline Patterson, who was... She was, was she in that one? <coughs> no, she wasn't. But you, you, you had me on stage as Phil McCann. You had Gerard Kelly. You had Andy Gray. You had Elaine Collins. And was a smashing Carlyle. cast. Mm -hmm. Or Robert Carlyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, as the young, he was the young me. <laughs> Gavin, Gavin as well. Gavin. I, no. Gavin, did Gavin not play young Jack Hall? I did. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> not in that production. Oh, did you? Oh, God, you must have been insignificant in your production. You, you've changed, obviously. <laughs> You've come out of your shell since those days. <laughs> Bobby has not left the <laughs> Was it Big Bobby? That's me going to do it. Right, okay, um, where did we get to? Yeah, we need more questions from, from, from everyone here. Um, anyone have a stunning experience when they first saw the Slab Boys or want to describe it or want to ask a question about it or um, say what John Byrne has meant to you? Um, in any way, yeah, uh, there's someone there. Yeah, fantastic. This might be more controversial than you want in a question, but I was interested in what you said, Joyce, about the idea that his plays almost heralded a new wave of, of theatre that was more accessible or more in keeping with what people were living. Um, do you think we've still got that coming through these days? Do we have the kind of air to John Byrne around? Are they working around just now? Do, do we need more of that? And is it, is, it, is it still happening? Or is it something that we need to find again, possibly? Uh, well, that, that's a great question. I'm going to put it to Andy first, because Andy, during lockdown, I should say, um, the Tron has been doing some amazing work in trying to identify new young writing and acting town in Scotland and Andy's um, had, you know, had a great season you know, so far um, exploring some of that since theatre started up again so I'm going to put that to you. Well that's yeah one, it's, I, I did a um, I did a call out uh, when I went in lockdown sitting at home <coughs> to discover actors in the west of Scotland I've never met before and I did a call out and they send me a self tape uh, you have to be living in the west of Scotland you have to have your face in spotlight so that you were a fresh actor as you were and you have to be somebody I've never auditioned or or met before. I got 400 of these self tapes, and, uh, and 40 of them I um, uh, met again online. Who are the most interesting of them? And one of them, this young actress uh, from Renfrew, uh, Ailey Lone. She uh, she had this. She the two minute clip she did. I thought it was wonderful. I said, Who wrote that? She said, she said I did. And um, so I went to see the play. It's a play that she'd written. Uh, about her dad and his pals when they were teenagers growing up in Renfrew and very, and they were all sort of either unemployed and just drinking every night or taking drugs and doing, and they decided to form a football team to try and change their lives. And uh, this football team was called Moorcroft. And uh, they, um, and, and it became a, a comic tragic story. And we, we uh, rested in the piece, worked on it, and uh, eventually we staged it at the Tron. Uh, uh, in this autumn, 
uh, this for the last spring rather, and, uh, and, and Alias self directed it. Uh, she was so committed, she had such a vision for the piece, nobody else could direct it really. And um, this piece, Moorcroft, uh, brought in half the audience, well, were, were people never been in a theatre before. It just brought in a massive audience, particularly from, because it spoke just like John's work, you know, 50, 60 years before, it spoke with a voice that people uh, on stage that people recognised, they didn't normally recognise. Uh, and it was a, a phenomenal success. I mean, it's standing ovation every night, and we're actually now going to stage it uh, next year. In fact, the National Theatre of Scotland, uh, Jackie Wiley runs that. She came up to me after she said, you know, you're speaking to the audience that we should be attracting. <laughs> and so they're now going to fund us to tour it. So that, that you know, in answer to the, the question, there's always, um, the, you know, the, 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 hopefully, there are continually new writers coming, and, but, uh, that, but the permission to speak with that working class voice was given by John all those years ago, and that opened, and, and now uh, there are some incredible writers about who are doing amazing pieces like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but you did say yourself, I mean, do you think it's more difficult now? I certainly feel, as somebody who's been reviewing theatre all these years, that there was a kind of energy in the 1980s when I first started reviewing. And it was a combination of two things, really. It was a very brilliant generation of people, like some of the people we've mentioned, you know, and Tom McGrath, Bill Bryan, and, and, and John, John himself. The Beverly, isn't it? Um, um, that, Joy McNeil. Um, yeah, That's yeah, great, right? yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's his name? Roddy McMillan. Roddy McMillan, yeah. Roddy McMillan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was an actor and a writer. Um, died very young, unfortunately. Um, 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 yeah, so there was a, 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 a very powerful and brilliant generation and the 784 and Wildcat people doing their own thing as well um, in, in the Scottish um, theatre scene at the, at the time and what was happening at the Citizens, which was, you know, a very formative and mind-blowing for a whole generation of people just, you know, um, seeing what a Glasgow theatre was capable of in terms of European and um, culture and all the rest of it. Um, so there was a huge amount going on in the 70s and 80s and I think it was a combination of a very, very able, kind of empowered generation, the sort of post-war generation who thought, you know, we all thought nothing was too good for us and the kind of resistance to the Thatcher period um, in, the, in the early 1980s which added a kind of political edge and a purpose to it. So there was a kind of drive behind developments like Mayfest which started in the early 1980s and so on. But I think we have slightly lost. I mean, I mean, the theatre has been under constant funding pressure since then, really, of one kind or another. The coming of the National Theatre in Scotland did in itself represent a big boost in the resources available for theatre in Scotland. And I think because of that, there is still a lot of tremendous work produced in Scotland, like what Elizabeth's been doing at Pitlochry and like what Andy does at the Tron. Um, but, but, you know, it's always hard and the kind of official pressures on it and the bureaucratic pressures become stronger and stronger and stronger. And, and the, the ability to just put something on and do it and get it out there is, is really, really hard. Of course, one of the things that has been a great saving grace of Scottish theatre in the last um, 18 years has been the marvellous Play Pie and Pint initiative at Oran Board in the West End, which many of you will have experienced and have enjoyed. And that, of course, came in a way out of the same tradition because it was David McLennan of Wildcat who ran the Wildcat company in the late 1970s and onwards with Dave Anderson, who, having had a few years of kind of in the wilderness, really, after Wildcat lost its funding, then had this brilliant idea of just slapping a new play on every week and, and, and charging people 10 quid to see it with a pie and a pint. I believe it's gone up now. Um, but um, 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 nonetheless, it's still um, quite a cheap outing. And, um, you know, 20 plays um, in the spring season, spring and summer season this year, and not a single one lost to COVID, and all brand new plays, and at least half of them very, very good indeed. So, you know, it, there, there's, there's plenty going on, but I do think there are also there are pressures and bureaucracies which do still bear down very heavily. And of course, the whole change in higher education and everything, which fortunately in Scotland we still do have free access to higher education, but places are harder to get. Um, and if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to get higher education outside Scotland, there's all the issue of fees and everything. You know, the whole attitude um, to people coming through from working class backgrounds has really been quite oppressive for the last 20 years, I think. And it's beginning to change now. People are beginning to observe that and try and do something about it. So there have been kind of gains and losses. And um, I think, you know, we, we do miss 
the kind of leadership of that kind of wonderful leading generation we had in the 1980s of, of whom John was one. What do you think? Are they talking too much? Can I just, just, just one small point? Yeah. yeah. It's just that Ailey's play, Moorcroft, and John's play, Underwood Lane, were both in the same season. Yeah. Uh, Ailey and John, uh, in Asia, 60 years apart. And yet, both played almost the same audience. They played to a working class audience because, as I said, 50% of the audience for Morkov never been a beer before, and they were not a third audience. And we sold out four weeks in advance, which never happened in my life before, for Underwood Lane, if the whole run was sold out. And again, 40% of the audience had never been to the Tron before, and again, they were not a third audience. They were, you know, every night, I didn't recognize anyone in the audience. They were ordinary punters. And that's the same acknowledgement of something. Even yeah. though they're 60 years apart, they've had that commonality, yeah. a piece of work that speaks to ordinary people. And yeah. is artistically extremely valuable as well. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Anybody else? have their say about the wonderful John Byrne before we come back to the panel and begin to line things up. Uh, if nobody has a question, can I sneak in a wee question for Elizabeth? Yeah, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so I just um, think about the, I was lucky enough, I don't know if anybody else in the room, to listen to the Donald Benoit play, the audio play, and it's exciting that will hopefully be on stage. But I guess your role of person on stage to actually have adapted a book of John, and obviously with Janine, so you you have a bit of an inside track, but it still has John's um, charm and it's, it's comedy and it's, it's lovely, but can you talk a wee bit about adapting the, the book and how you kind of face that and the great songs that are in it? Yeah, I mean, I didn't adapt it, Janine did. So it's, it's a shame she's not right. I, I just had the joy of uh, working with Janine and John on making it live on audio. I can take absolutely zilch credit mm -hmm. for the adaptation. Um, but I think working with Janine and John on making that work is very much centred on John's characters, I would say, which is what Janine was incredibly faithful to. And I think coming back to your point that you were asking before, um, I'd love to talk to you about it afterwards because I'd like to know what you think about, you know, the work that's being made right now with regards to the voice that comes through with John because I think What's so unique about John's work is, yes, it's often very diverse, but you still know it's him. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about the, the characters and the complexity of those people who are working class that they don't have to fit into, as Joyce said, right at the beginning. That kind of what... I, there's a phrase that you learn in television when you're doing your script editor course, as I did at the BBC, which is called poverty porn. And, you know, this awful thing, you know, which for me, David and I were joking, because I'm from a council estate in Croydon, and before the event today we were joking about where I was from. And actually you don't want to see your life reflected in this poverty porn at all. You want to see it reflected in John Byrne's view of the world. And I think what Donald and Benoit captures in the story is this incredibly beautiful story about family and about childhood and about coming of age and about community and family not being nuclear in the way that we all talk about now and what Janine did exceptionally well in the adaptation is articulate all of those characters that are actually based on John's children because I think what John does brilliantly in the same way that Ailey did with Moorcroft is write what you know and don't be afraid of that and it's still art. That's why John does so many self-portraits. Nobody goes, oh, John, we've had enough of you. <laughs> you know, it's like, no, we want to see you exploring you still because there's still something to be found in that that's truthful for me in the same way as it's truthful for you. So, yeah, it's all credit to Janine and John. Nothing to do with me, Martin. <laughs> Jean, Janine, do you want to say anything? Uh, I think I can. Give, give Janine the microphone yeah. for a minute. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it would make him an amazing play, and it's just such a beautiful book. The characters are so wonderful, and yes, Donald and Benoit definitely have um, elements in them that are very much to do with the, the twins, Honor and Saviour, and knowing them as they grew up. So anyway, um, I, I said to John often, "Do you fancy doing this? You know, how, don't you think this would be a great idea?" And in the end, he sort of said in slight exasperation, "Well, you do it." If you think, you know, and he knows that I enjoy writing and I've written some other things that he'd enjoyed. So I, I wrote a scene and then I would read it to him and we'd, we'd do, do it together and then talk about it a wee bit. I have to say quite often, much to my amazement, he just said, yeah, I love it, it's great. 
<laughs> and maybe that's just after many years of spending a lot of time, I've managed to kind of soak in enough of John and his culture and his background and know enough from his stories to be able to interpret that. Um, and I don't think completely without my own voice as well. I don't mean just being sort of, you know, a cipher. Um, and then other times he would say, oh, how about this? Or you'd come up with a great wordplay or a great joke. And we'd put that in. And we'd put in little stories and echoes, I think, of his previous work and of his life as well, which hopefully maybe people picked up. Like, I put the DJ in. Um, and that was very much a big, a huge nod to Tutti Frutti because I just yeah. think that's just, you know, such a fantastic character which Gavin played, who was yeah. here somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Fantastically, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And that was definitely a big, you know, to add in to that. But it was just, it just I, I just felt like it just completed those circles. And the other thing I think I'd like to say about John and his, his characters is he believes in fun. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to, as she said, he doesn't want to watch somebody having a miserable time no. in a cancer state. <laughs> because actually what he found in his background was, you know, love. he came from a, yeah, a house full of love. You don't need money, you need love. And you need fun and you need laughter. And, and all those characters that he knew in Fergusley Park gave him everything that he needed, you know, to write. Um, and so we just kind of found the fun. It was all about having fun and we laughed and we wrote and, and it was great, you know, and yeah. it, the cats. And we, we had, I have to tell you one story though. When the book was published, we went to, it was published by an American publisher. We went to New York for this meeting and there's this very New York guy kind of talking away really earnestly. And he said that actually the version that John had written was unacceptable. <laughs> and he said, well, I'm afraid we just can't have our dogs little dogs drinking and smoking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, we can't have characters doing that. So John just said, and said, but dogs don't drink and smoke. We all know that, you know. I mean, <laughs> well, no. oh, okay, so that's right, I'll get rid of that. Get rid of the cigarettes and we'll get rid of the whiskey. And then um, he said, oh, there has to be another big change. You have to introduce another character because we're no longer allowed to publish books in America where a child is seen to be left, abandoned, without someone being in loco parentis. Can you believe that? So Oliver Tr Twist would now not be... <laughs> or, or Harry Potter, really. They all were, like, it's just absolute madness. So that's where Bucky Mackay came in, Colin. Um, so we had to have kind of a character in the book that... So he had to come in and rewrite him. Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> but you know, when he wants something to happen, you just... And he, it enraged John. He just said, this is ridiculous. Yes, it's just... It's just and we all, but anyway, he did it, and hopefully we brought out, and I think also the band and the songs, it just brought out all that joy, that joie de vivre of John's works. So that's great to do. Fantastic. And hopefully we'll see it on stage at some point. Oh, wonderful, Jenny, yeah, and hopefully we all sort of see it on stage. Um, right, I'll now come back to the panel again and talk a little bit about the impact and the recognition of John's work. Because if you've been around the exhibition, you'll see that some people, uh, particularly maybe in the visual arts world, I, I don't know if this is more of a concern in the visual arts side than it is in the theatre side, or whether both are equally concerned, but there does seem to be a concern that uh, because of John's very sort of polymath quality and the fact that he is a playwright and a great visual artist and a designer and a graphic designer and a theatre designer and um, all the other things that he does, um, that, that he sometimes doesn't get the recognition really that is his due. And then there's the whole issue of being and remaining Scottish. His voice has never been not one that was rooted in Scotland. Um, and um, there's a question of whether he gets more international recognition than he gets UK recognition, although he has been greatly recognised in London at different times in his career. So I just wondered about that whole issue of his recognition and of making sure, if you like, that future generations, certainly here in Scotland, get to know as much about um, John Byrne as they should. And I wondered whether any of you have any thoughts about that, Andy? Well, you've yes. just done a production of one of his plays, so I suppose that's you right. doing your bit. I'm just thinking of my last couple of anecdotes. One is actually a Scottish voice, but we, we started a very a long time, a very bizarre text exchanges 
uh, Robert Bush started to work together, and I, he always called me Uncle Reg, and I called him Pippa. I I, and it would always be in a company accent, actually. Was, so there you are. It could be a company advice as well. But just funny, I just one thing I just want to mention: we talk about it, it, when you go to an exhibition. I remember when I went round it. You know, all this work I could see. You know, so much John Starler work. And then I there was this. I went into one room, and this. Well, you can see it there. This big, old-fashioned looking painting of a board of directors, very naturalistic photographic piece. I thought they must have, they must have left that up there rather than one day. And then there's a little brass plaque under it, and it said that you know John was commissioned to paint this board of directors, and he, he needed the money to fund Riot's Cramp going to the fringe. And you can imagine anybody doing that now, it just wouldn't happen, would it? And that's a measure of the guy, I think, really, that extraordinary. Um, it's surely passion about making his work happen, but also the ability on so many different levels to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and what, what do you think about the, the level of recognition that he has? I mean, you said that some of the young actors that you cast in under Reed Lane didn't go to John. Before. That's right, yeah, they didn't. Uh, and, uh, but, I, you know, they do now. And, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, exactly. I think that's important. why it's important to keep station work, to be honest. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't know how many of you saw under Reed Lane, but let's give Andy a round of applause for getting that out. I mean, had you ever heard of it before you arrived in Scotland? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the first time I encountered John's work was as a visual artist um, and then as a playwright. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think part of the... When you start delving into John's work, for me it was the fascination with the pseudonyms, you know, the yeah, taking yeah. on different personas. And when you get to know John and you end up in that text conversation, <laughs> you go, oh, I understand how his imagination is so fertile that in order to do what he's doing he has to transport himself or transport you with him yeah. to you know I still remember when he handed me the typed version of Tennis Elbow by Dodo Inkpeg. It's like right, am I gonna meet Dodo? You know, and you sort of have this exchange, you know, and I think I think it's I think it's our our collective responsibility and that's why this exhibition is so brilliant yeah. to sh to to keep his work alive and you know the fact that Andy's just done the most exceptional production it's about making sure that all of us keep making the work and then that shares it with the next generation you know like none of the actors in Underwood Lane are ever going to question who John Byrne is again and become the disciples as you know I would say mm. you know who then share the word and, you know and, and so I don't, I don't yeah I, I just think he's awesome and I think anybody that any of us encounter we should just go on a lot about him and we have the responsibility of handing over an image or a book. Or a, but I think yeah. I think that's true of a lot of artists who we love. You hand them on, don't you? You kind of you gift them to people, and you go, God, I I really love this person. Please share yeah. in that yeah. with me. Yeah. So, yeah. Have it, um, David. It's a tricky one, that. I mean, I I wish dearly that his reputation was greater uh, because I think he's everything he does is, has a universal theme to it. I think it's instantly accessible. It's every man, every woman. Um, but maybe that's the way of geniuses. They're never quite recognized or accepted or applauded enough during their lifetimes. Sadly, we may have to wait till John is no longer with us before he, he has that <laughs> true recognition. That would be really sad. It would. Because um, I think he has such a unique voice. And he has a unique voice for everyone. No matter where you come from, no matter what your background, you will always find a common, there's a humanity that runs through his work. Yeah. And he gives us that wonderful ability to laugh at great tragedy. I mean, yeah. we laugh at these mammies stoning their head after the co-op windy. Yeah. I mean, that's genius. Just doesn't she finally take a dive through it? I just think she does, but very. Yeah. There's a kind of image of his mother diving through the co-op window. You know, and that was a great tragic period in John's life, but he yeah. writes about it in yeah. such a way that yeah. You have to, it's so life affirming his work yeah. because he makes you laugh at everything. There's comedy and everything, there's humanity and everything. And it's how we learn uh, about life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. He, he gives us the ability to laugh at our tragedies. Yeah, and, and creates. And rejoice in our yeah. triumphs. And creates a world out of it that's just alive with sort of humour and awareness and, mm. and, and fun. Absolutely um, unique, really. Well, um, yeah. 
But, uh, sorry, sorry, Martin. Oh, that's our signal to wind up. Yes, we're just winding up. Yeah, we're winding up, so that's good. Um, well, um, um, you know, um, where to take all of that. I'm so glad that all of you are here and have had the chance to see the exhibition because it is a wonderful exhibition. So first of all, I just want once again to thank everyone at Kelvin for the exhibition. enabled us to celebrate the, 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 the side of John's work that is hard to capture in an exhibition, which is, um, which is um, the theatrical side. Um, it's been a tremendous privilege to be up on stage with this panel. Um, what a terrific um, panel, really. And, uh, you know, as I said, that this long experience of John's work, for some of us tracking back more than 40 years now, uh, is it, well, yeah, it is more than 40 years, and the vividness of that, and how it always is in the now with us. It's never about, uh, it's never about sort of, you know, being nostalgic for the past. It's all about this creative drive to create fun and, 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 and a sort of vision and, um, and beauty as well, and to drive that towards the future. So thank you all so much for just sharing that, that kind of 40 years of can jobs. Deadly mischievous as well. Is this a I, deadly anecdote? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I did, after I played King Lear at the Sits, um, Dominic said, what do you want to do next? And I said, I'd love to do a revival of the Slab Boys. A major revival hadn't been done for almost like a generation. I know there had been other productions. <clears throat> so we did. And during that time, the Sits were looking for... Oh, Jerry, will you behave yourself? Can I take, can I take you anywhere? Um, the Sits were looking for major funding to keep the building, that beautiful, beautiful, perfect uh, theatre of drama, uh, to keep it alive for another hundred years. So Nicola Sturgeon paid a visit. And John was very against the, uh, the, uh, the no smoking, uh, the smoking ban. He was absolutely livid. That's your personal freedom, your personal right. So Nicola, Nicola comes into the rehearsal room, gives her, and I introduce her to all the company as Andy. So and so and so and so. And I said, this is John. And John walks up to Nicola Sturdy and says, do you know fancy a wee puff? <laughs> <laughs> she just went kind of ash and white. I mean, I'm fucking loony. <laughs> oh. I'm not, I wish I'd taken a photograph. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's fantastic, David. Thank you. So uh, let's give the biggest, biggest of thank yous to this great panel. Andy Arnold. <laughs> Um, as we can see in this exhibition, at the core of it all, the painting. I remember once chairing an uh, event with John at Summer Hall when he talked in depth about his painting and that passion for painting, which is still with him now at the age of 82, um, and which you can see in all of the wonderful work here. I think that painting and drawing has always been the wellspring of everything else he's been able to give to us. So it's wonderful to have it all gathered together here. Thank you for being with us tonight. And thank you, Martin. No, and I was going to say thanks to Joyce, obviously, for... Oh, really? for...